Welcome to the Saga World Podcast. I'm Mark Hoyer, Editor-in-Chief. I'm with Kevin Cameron, our technical editor. This week's show is on a Ducati. It's on the Ducati Hyper Motard 698 Mono and Mono RVE. The RVE gets some very cool graphics and a quick shifter. Otherwise, the bikes are the same. Um, we had the opportunity earlier, well, actually late last year, to talk to the engineer in charge of the project, who was uh, Stefano Fantoni. We set that up with Ducati North America. We got a video call in the run-up to ICMA. They took the time in the run-up to ICMA, which is the insane Milan show. Insane for manufacturers who have to present there. But they took the time to talk to us about the bike. So um, it's a Ducati single, a giant Ducati single. Uh, making big power. And I'd like to go back in history first. I know normally I throw to you, Kevin, and you take it away, but I'm going to go back in history because Ducati was a singles company making singles. And then they made a V-twin using the singles that they had existing and putting them into a 90 degree V and lo, the Ducati Superbike was born and it did great, right? We have lots of history in racing and and the Practically the entire pro product line was based on this this V twin, and then it switched to belts, etc. And now, uh, well, and then in 1993 we had the Super Mono, which took a V twin and then removed the vertical cylinder, and left the horizontal and left the connecting rod and a weight inside to counterbalance that single cylinder that was half of the 900. So that's a twin becoming back to a single, which it was a single in the first place anyway. So, hey, and then now we're back. We've taken a 1299 and they really did it this time. There is no vestigial cylinder. There's no other balancer. Now I'm going to throw it to Kevin Cameron and let's talk about the 698 engine. Well, they um, had a wonderful cylinder head that uh, would, I'm sure it's very much the story is very much like the one of, of the Vincent with the two drawings of the Comet single. And someone laid one over the other and said, oh, we could make a V-twin. And uh, 1299 and the related products had had a lot of cylinder head development. So here's a free cylinder head. What could we, we could jack that thing up and put a single under it. I got to pause you. That's a great point. And the reason I pause you is I think, and I've had a little bit of empirical data to back this up, but I think when a manufacturer gets a combustion chamber that works, that other bikes and like other engines follow, like they go, you know, this worked over here. Let's put this combustion chamber into this thing. Absolutely true. Yeah, absolutely true. And especially where big bore where there's a big bore involved, which is, what, 160 How big is it? <laughs> yeah, it's really big. And 116 millimeters big. Bigger than a big block Chevy. And uh, to get that thing to run on one spark plug is an accomplishment. But Ducati have been working on that kind of thing for years and years. The reason that they didn't make their Grand Prix bike a V-twin is because... Um, Claudio Domenicali told me, we have no experience with cylinders that big. But now they do because they kept developing the 90 degree V-twin in World Superbike. Even when it was uh, parity with, uh, displacement parity with four cylinders. And Finally, they went all the way to 1200 for the superbike and, and 1299 for the street bike. And I think this is a particular skill that Ducati have. I think they have a combustion department. And each they've made so many changes in engines, bore and stroke, that I believe they um, have a method for achieving relatively rapid relatively efficient combustion, even at highly over square bore and stroke ratios. This thing there's is a lot up there. This is 1.8. Yeah. yeah. There's a lot to unpack. <laughs> there's a lot to unpack there. I guess um, what you just said reminds me in talking to Stefano Fantoni at Ducati is what he said. You were talking about that. You were talking about induction and um, turbulence. And he said, well, we have some different ideas 
uh, than other manufacturers about airflow. And I thought, man, what a pregnant comment to make. <laughs> you yeah, know, you like, we, we have other ideas, which is goes to what you're saying, having a department uh, dedicated to it. Now, you know, the bore and stroke ratio is one thing that you might want to explain. I think maybe if we start with what are the challenges of a big bore uh, in terms of like flame speed and all of that, like maybe we can illuminate that a little bit and try to understand what the specific challenges are if the field of fire sure. is supposed to be this big versus this big, how does that work? Absolutely. You will find if you make a family of engines, a family of cylinders, all having the same displacement, but different bore and stroke ratio, that the ones with the smallest bore will burn the most quickly. Not only because it's a shorter distance from the spark plug to the cylinder wall, but also because since you're going to have a high compression ratio, if the cylinder bore is relatively smaller, the stroke is longer and therefore the height of the combustion chamber in which we want to store all this life-giving turbulence all the way to top dead center, uh, there's room for it. And the antithesis of this was the old time engines that had tall piston domes that remind, I think of them as ecclesiastical pistons because they are like church steeples. And what they do is they have so much surface area and the combustion volume is spread out in a very thin lamina over this large area that the flame speed is greatly slowed down because the little turbulence cells who are trying to pass the flame from this one to this one to this one, there's so many of them that the combustion becomes very slow. And the longer you hold hot combustion gas up against the cylinder head, the more energy leaks away in the form of waste heat. It heats the piston, it heats the combustion chamber, and it heats the radiator. Well, and also what can happen? Well, we get rattle, we get knock. <laughs> yes, certainly. Because when, when combustion slows down, it allows more time for the heat driven chemical reactions in the fuel air mixture to get all the way to the point where it has turned into a self uh, igniting uh, violent explosive. Now, this is not pre ignition, pre ignition happens before the spark. Detonation, knock, tinkle, etc., begins as a perfectly normal cycle. The spark ignites the mixture. The pressure begins to rise in the cylinder. The flame front goes out, reaches nearly to the cylinder wall. But meanwhile, the last part of the charge out there has been heated and compressed and abused for a long time. And if those chemical reactions go far enough, they're generating little active radicals. Uh, Senator McCarthy, are you listening? Uh, that, <laughs> sorry, uh, that it auto ignites and then it burns at or above the speed of sound. And when those sonic shock waves hit the inside of the engine, we hear that knocking sound. Terrible sound, really. It Four is. Of, of awful bad, things. bad things, yes. And so uh, this is why rapid combustion, why you should have a department of rapid combustion. And what Claudio Domenicali told me about their method, their general method, was that the two variables they worked with were the intake duct diameter, which means the velocity of air entering the cylinder, which is going to be the energy from which turbulence will come, and the downdraft angle of the intake pipe. When it's steep, most of that energy is used in filling the cylinder. When it is not so steep, more like Cosworth land, 30 degrees, it tends to create a tumble motion where the intake comes in through the intake valves, flows across the head, hits the cylinder wall, goes down to the piston, 
up the near cylinder wall to create to produce an energy a, a, a really a, a, a gas flywheel and it is the energy in that flywheel that will become turbulence when the piston crowds all that material up to the cylinder head it's like the skater pulling her arms in in order to spin faster because you're crowding that the whole cylinder full of charge into the, the small clearance between the piston and the head at top dead center. So that's why we want good uh, turbulence and short combustion is to avoid knock. And unfortunately, the easiest way to avoid knock is to reduce the compression ratio, which means it reduces the torque along with it. So this is a problem worth solving. Yeah, and efficiency and all the things that would go with that. And I, you know, when you say all of this, it reminds me of ha having rebuilt my Velocet 500 single 1954, like, you know, 17 times in my ownership. I got a good look at the combustion chamber and the piston, and it is a domed piston. They did it to make room for valves because the valves kind of are angled this way. They're trying to get a larger valve. And that, you know, that speaks to, I mean, that's an air-cooled motor, but it's like eight and a half to one or something, or sometimes I have yeah. to put compression plates under for modern fuel. And I always, you know, from the simplest perspective, I always thought of the domed piston as like, well, the, the flame has to go over the mountain. This distance is far, much for farther sure. than this plateau. And what we have in the Ducati engine is, yeah, it's 116 millimeters. So it's huge for well over four inches um, is a big flat area. And it's yes, gigantic. the valves that were at an angle in the Veloset have come up. Have the valve angle has been reduced, and they have and they have enough room to make it as big as they want it to be. Yes, they're not. They're. I mean, they can. They have as much. I would. I would think they have as much breathing as they could possibly want. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, and of course, the reason why you make a very large bore is not because it's cool. It's because that's how you get enough room to have the valves that can fill the cylinder in a very short time that high RPM is going to allow for it. It's got to go and have the intake process finished. Not a not a big not a big long sigh, but a sudden sonic, nearly sonic intake event yeah so there's a couple things going on one of them is i'm going to apply my extremely high mathematical skills and say okay this engine's claimed horsepower with the stock exhaust is 77.5 and if this is half of a 1299 that's you know less than that's not that. That's not as much power as a twelve ninety nine. So if we double it, where where'd that power go? What's going on? Well, that power had to go because uh, the twelve ninety nine is a great big motor. So even if it has a somewhat limited bottom torque, there's so much displacement that um, you can haul yourself, and you're not in considerable bulk of a girlfriend or whatever is on the back seat away from an uphill stoplight, no trouble. But if you try to do the same thing with a high revving little single, uh, doesn't have the muscular displacement. So for this and for other reasons, you, you pull back from the cam timing that the 1299 is given. And they mentioned specifically, uh, Stefano mentioned specifically, that they shortened the valve overlap. So this is what happened with Ducati's first V4, which was uh, first spoken of in 1959 as a police bike for Berliner. Apollo. Apollo. And then uh, came into being in 1961. When they first built it, it had 100 horsepower, and it tore up every tire they put on it. So they dialed it back to 80 horsepower by reducing the compression from 10 to 1 to 8 to 1, and Harleyizing the cam timing, that is making it more punchy down low, which means taking away top end power. So that had only 80 horsepower. Then they came back again 
because that still tore up tires. And they reduced the compression to seven to one. And they dialed the cam timing back even more. And they ended up with 65 horsepower. And that worked, that the tires weren't eaten up. So in order to make a single as tractable as you would like it, you're going to have to come away from the valve timings of a big displacement machine. Also, um, if, if we're talking about dirt, we don't want explosive power. We want level power. And the way to get that is with shorter cam timings. And the way that works is if you open the intake valves at top dead center and close them at bottom dead center, after a while, you're going to say, well, wait a minute, we've got that air moving into the cylinder like 100 degrees after top dead center, and then we're starting to close the valves. If we left the valves open longer, air would keep rushing in and power would keep rising. So you delay the valve closing until uh, you get to the point where it's unrideable and you come back a bit. <laughs> it's like free horsepower in a way. But um, old time Harley camshafts were close to that open mm -hmm. stop dead center, closes bottom dead center, because they needed grunt to move a heavy motorcycle uh, from, a, from a dead stop. You know, I have to, I have to pause about, uh, they, they change, you change it so much and it becomes unrideable. That, that has been a theme in all the, all the development people I've talked to over decades of, of yeah. talking to development people is they still take it so far. Uh, the, uh, Andrea Forney, uh, Ducati test rider years ago, we were on a, on a ride and I was talking about frame development and I was getting some uh, movement in the chassis of this ST3 that we were testing, and, or ST4. And uh, we, I was getting some movement in the chassis, and we were talking about rake and trail and all that. And I said, well, how do you, you know, how do you, you know, how do you engineer a chassis, one of your trellis frames? And he's like, oh, well, we build the frame until it's strong enough. And then we just send the test rider out. And, and he's like, yeah, that's good. And then we bring the frame back in, and we start taking braces out we just take material out of it until he complains and then we put the last one we took out and put it back in yes so we make it you know we make it unrideable and and then we dial it back and there you go but that's you know that's the goal of engineering right like you can make an extremely strong engine that weighs 50 percent more than it should and or yes. could and so we our goal is always as light as possible with all the durability etc so Anyway, and the worst example is a top fueler that has to be uh, completely overhauled every four seconds. One of the things that we should mention is vibration, yeah. because when Ducati was a singles company uh, from, say, 56 onward, they started out with 125s and 250s. Um, and that vibration isn't so bad because the piston is a little light thing and a motorcycle is much bigger than the piston. So it doesn't get uh, set into vibration as easily. But uh, when they had the Desmo, um, they brought back Desmo in 68, the 350 was quite a vibrator and they built a 450 and the 450 vibrated so much it was the bike that would slowly move across a concrete floor on its center stand while it was running. Oh yeah. And if you rev it, it moves faster. It moves faster. <laughs> no, uh, they were notorious. Yeah. The four fifties were notorious for being pretty vibratory. So at a point they built a 500 twin and it was quite heavy. I think it was around 400 pounds and they seemed to have, uh, I think there was a, a push on to make a bigger motorcycle because they couldn't just keep making bigger and bigger singles. Well, that didn't work either. So I think uh, Taglioni uh, was aware that the Apollo was a 90 degree V4. Uh, people have been aware since about 1900 that a 90 degree V twin has inherent or can be given inherent primary balance, meaning at the crankshaft speed, without uh, any trick counter shafts or any other nonsense. So that's what makes that really attractive. So along comes uh, the, the first, the bevel drive 
V-twin. And the thing revved, made its power at 97.50 or thereabouts. And here I am standing in front of the glass van at Imola in 1972, talking with Paul Smart. And he says, they're telling me this thing makes peak power at 9,700 RPM. Is that even possible? And, of course, you have to realize that Paul grew up in a world of Norton Manx singles. 7,200 was hot stuff. Well, by making the engine self-balancing, Ducati set the twin free from, from all these vibration issues that cause modern people, when they ride one of those older bikes, to say, are they all like that? So that was a great and liberating decision. And they can now make a giant single like this because it has counterbalancers. And that's a point that I wanted to make is that, that yes, there are people who feel that counterbalancers, oh, this thing suck wicked horsepower, man, got to take them out. Take them out and break the frame. Yeah, well, they, they tried taking the counterbalancers out of the, the Harley race bikes. And yeah. uh, no, you don't do that. Like, it's not designed to do that. It wasn't, you know, you can't no, like, sir. You put them back in. And frankly, I don't mind if there's anything that's slowing the inertia down on the rear wheel a little bit with whatever torque they have. Right. Yeah. I mean, Ducati built, you know, you should talk about the balance scheme there and, you know, various, maybe various ways of doing that. But they have two going in this one, do they not? Yeah. Yeah. Because if you if you make yourself a little chart uh, with four positions, 0, 90, 180, 270, and you map out where the counterweight is and the piston and so forth, if you, if you balance 50% of the reciprocating, the back and forthing weight, then what you get is a rotating imbalance of constant value rotating opposite to the crankshaft. And this is a wonderful thing because you can balance that with eccentric eccentric weights on shafts rotating at crankshaft speed. And you can end up with something that does not break the frame, does not make the balls of your feet hot, does not put your behind to sleep. Does not make the grip feel like it's this big in your three hand. inches like, in diameter. Like, yes. you're, like you're holding a tennis ball. I rode a Norton Cafe racer. And I think it it must have had a like a commando crank in it, and a commando crank has a weight balance that works with ice elastics with okay. the rubber. Yeah. And then if you put that into a solid mount into the feather bed frame, which is a, the first time yeah. I rode a feather bed frame, I was blown away. Except when you got past thirty four hundred on this this bike, <laughs> I my eyes would fizz. Like it would literally lose my vision and the grips did feel like this big. It just was like a light switch. It was yes. insane. And that, you know, we can control that now. We, we, we've known about counterbalances a long time, but you know, the, they're in full bloom. They're used everywhere. They're made, you know, we're tuning them to give us the relationship, the, the feeling of the engine, uh, or to give us enough of that coming back from the bike and ride, you know, riding a motorcycle now, like we can make engineering choices and we can satisfy that relationship, satisfy that comfort, or we can make a gold wing with a flat six and we don't have to balance anything yeah. or an inline six, which has perfect zeros all by itself. Yes. No, no vibration there. It's, it's, uh, we live in a great time. Um, so, you know, I think we have a good technical grip on what the power plant's been doing. We know it's half of a, 1299 and a few of the you know throwing the balancers in had to do that um big valves big flat piston right compression a little bit less power it's desmo i think we get a lot from desmo like certainly ducati can control its valve timings may perhaps more freely than other manufacturers can here's, the, here's the thing here's the thing about desmo and this is how ducati may have an advantage in off-road because uh, around 2006 in MotoGP, the companies that were still using metal valve springs were having to change them every night because they were having to raise the stress level in the spring, work it harder, 
and that caused the fatigue process to move faster. So before long, there were the Ducatis, which had Desmo, and there were all the others who were, and still are, using pneumatic springs, just air in a little space that's compressed. There's not a lot of pressure there. There's not a lot of super technology. It's just that nobody ever found a fatigue crack in air. Doesn't vibrate. That's right. It's wonderful stuff. <laughs> wonderful Doesn't stuff. start to sing, you know, like a spring can start to oscillate all kinds of bad yes, things. Yes, that's right. Air, Residence. air just says, who cares, man? Go ahead. Squeeze me. So, um, Ducati worked hard on this whole thing, and I could hear the edge in Domenicali's voice when he said, I would like better to see in your articles a recognition that Desmo is more than just something left over from the 1950s. We've stayed with Desmo and we have developed it to be the equal of any other system. And we use it because that's what we have the most experience with. So Ducati have now won the world championship in MotoGP two years. And evidently, their Desmo system is the equivalent in performance of pneumatic springs, which were, which were invented by people at Renault for Formula One. And what this means is, and, and nobody has gone back to steel springs. P steel springs may have improved since 2006, but nobody's going back to them. So here is off-road motorcycling, which is all steel springs. Ducati arrives with Desmo, which seems to have a two-pound weight penalty. Oh, dear. <laughs> yeah. Lots to talk about that. I mean, we should preface this with, like, we're talking about the big street single, which has Desmo, but we're also talking about the uh, the Desmo 450 motocross 450, bike, yep. the yep. prototypes that they're racing. And so, yeah, so you're getting, you're maybe getting more freedom and valve control because Desmo is a cam to open and a cam to close. And there is, a, yes. there is like usually a helper spring that just ensures that nothing bounces around. There's a very little spring, but it's not doing the work. Right. Nope. It's just at low RPM. It's helping the valve close more positively for a better, better idle or whatever. And so essentially you're not dealing with springs and you're able to maybe accelerate the valve open hard and close it in a way that you couldn't do with a closing ramp and spring. Normally with a valve spring engine, you design the acceleration so that the acceleration during the cam controlled phase, which is the initial lifting the valve up to speed and then decelerating it onto the seat so that it doesn't go kabang and bounce all over the place. <laughs> that is three times the acceleration provided by the spring, which once the valve is up to speed, the spring has to stop it without letting it hop off of the nose of the cam. Dreaded float. Falling, yes, falling onto the closing flank with a great clank and shock that damages parts. So what we have here is Ducati has potentially the ability to go farther in the direction that produces a flat torque curve from here to there than it's possible to go with steel springs, farther than it is possible to go with steel springs. Yeah. And that's, so, I mean, of, yeah, of all it. the advantages, you know, in particularly on the dirt where you're dealing with, you know, dirt's got a certain level of traction. It always has, you know, maybe it changes from day to day or with moisture, but you're, you're, you're really just like in dirt track, you're relying on the, we, we don't have electronics for this. We have them, but we don't use them. So what yep. you're relying on is the rider's ability to apply the throttle and to keep the motorcycle driving forward without a break in traction, yep. which then, particularly in racing terms, takes a very long time to recover. Yes, If you lose or lose drive and you get all that spin, so you're giving the rider an element of control and a big swell of torque that allows them to do what they need to do to win. 
Yes, it makes the engine more linear so that what you twist is what you get. Whereas uh, during the the honored years of the sport bike, it was nothing, 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 a little bit. (laughs) And uh, (laughs) a lot of people loved that. I just remember, I remember riding some like FZ something Yamaha 750 built up with flat slides yep. and, uh, you know, hot motor, a lot of cam and all that and going as I'm rolling the throttle on and it's like coughing and it finally clears its throat. Go, 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 go. It's like yep. everything you didn't want to have happen. Yes. Yeah. That's when well, you want to be Anthony Gobert at his best. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Or at his worst. I don't know. Well, <laughs> I mean, that's I take, point of view. Maybe I would, point of view. Yeah. yeah. So I guess, um, you know, I, uh, it, it's probably a good time to uh, transition to what the bike was like to ride. I didn't, uh, I didn't ride it, but our editor, Bradley Adams, flew to Europe to ride the um, Hyper Motard 698 Mono and Mono RVE. They went to a kart track. Um, I don't know about you guys out there in uh, in video and podcast land, but every time I look at a hyper motard or motard bike in general, my collarbones tingle in a good way. But uh, um, anyway, welcome to the show, Bradley. You have the honor of being our first guest, but you bring back the truth and uh, uh, experience of riding the uh, the mono. Let us let us know what's up, dude. Uh, yeah, excited to excited to get to talk to you guys about the bike, uh, which in itself is is an exciting motorcycle. I mean, and I will say, yes, it was a car track, so no street ride, which was a little bit unfortunate. But uh, yeah, I mean, that's that's the environment where you really get to see what that thing is capable of. And the cool thing about that car track is talking with Xavi Forez, who is actually there with you know he's a Ducati rider, rode a Moto America Super Sport last year. And uh, he said it's a it's a popular training ground for a lot of a lot of GP and, and superbike riders. Oh, that he, specific track. Yeah, yeah. So oh, he wow. he doesn't live very far from there, and he came over and and rode rode the bike alongside with Josh Heron. And yeah, oh, that must apparently have been that's mental. a place. Oh, yeah. So so we're trying to figure the bike out, and 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 myself trying to figure out how to ride a supermoto properly because I have very limited experience on a supermoto. Obviously, a big road racing background, but but not in sliding the thing necessarily. And so I'm, I'm trying to learn the thing and then watching those guys who Josh Heron for, for many years, uh, at his house in Georgia had a car track in his backyard. So the, the guy, the guy can ride anything, but the guy can ride a super, a super motorbike, especially well. And, and watching them rip around on those hyper motards was incredible. I mean, you're, well, Heron's, like, yeah, Heron's pretty unglued anyway, right? Like he's very much the, like, put it sideways, do a giant, you know, stand up yeah. wheelie. Like he's, yeah. He's extremely talented and also has like a streak of showiness, right? Yeah. So, but he's, he's just very confident in his skill set, right? So like a yeah. lot of guests, you know, a lot of the media for sure, you get out to a, a press launch and you're just like, hey, let's just let's just learn the bike. Our job is to to take, uh, you know, a story home with us, right? Where where Josh's Josh's role is to create the absolute coolest content he can, which includes sliding the bike everywhere, big stand up wheelies, like standing on the seat and doing wheelies, and uh, yeah, and just ripping around and showing what that thing is capable of which is is what he did yeah him and javi both it was incredible to watch well you mentioned the two techniques is basically you know if somebody's grown up road racing it's not that they can't pick up the supermoto style but you have basically generally speaking in a foot on the peg style riding like road race sticking your knee out and then you and you can pitch the thing you know you can do a brake slide hacker that way like you can go into the corner sideways and and all that but you also have the supermoto style which is very much it is different. You are having your leg off the bike and it's generally a little bit more sideways than your, you know, your uh, feet on the pegs type of style. So, yeah. And I mean, Ducati says that, you know, they, they worked with the ergonomics, the rider triangle to make it so that it was a bike that you could either, you know, put, go knee out like a road race bike or supermoto style. The day that we rode the group that we were with, I'm not sure if it was mostly because it was people with a, a road racing or street background, the majority of people we're riding it, you know, knee down road race style, including Josh Heron. Uh, I did see a couple of guys go, go leg out supermoto style. I have taken a supermoto class years back and did a day there. And, you know, they say that, Hey, do whatever feels comfortable to you They're They basically end up being about the same speed wise. I'm not sure how true that is, but yeah, the, the bike itself developed for both. 
uh, I was comfortable doing going going knee out. But um, yeah, I think I think you could ride it either either way, which which goes to what Ducati was trying to build this bike for and build it like a proper super moto bike, right? I've I've ridden the hyper motards, the bigger hyper motards before, and and for sure those ones felt like just a, a bigger, more street focused motorcycle, but, but not something that we would have done nearly what we did with with this six nine eight. Yeah, I mean all the hyper motard, the Ducati hyper motards I've ridden, when you first get on them, they they do feel tall. They feel rock hard within the street bike realm. Yeah. And you feel a little bit odd when you get on them. But after a couple hours, you're doing insane things you never thought you would be doing on something that was a, quote, street bike. But it's not like a regular super mo- motard right. bike where it's just, it's lighter. It's more agile. Like, I'm curious from your perspective, you know, riding the bike, front end feel, like maybe take us through cornering on that bike like what are you getting you know super motard bike is essentially like a motocross i mean that's where they came from the french in the you know 90s whatever taking motocross bikes and putting 17s on them and lowering them a little bit and then road racing them on car tracks and it it was sort of this weird phenomenon then you try one and you're like oh my god i think i just had like a season's worth of learning in two days of riding because they're so mental they're so direct and i think i'm curious how yeah that's that's the question take us through a corner what's your feeling how super motard is it and then talk to us about corner exit and gearing and that kind of stuff yeah so yeah hectic is a a good way of describing it i mean especially riding a bike with with that amount of power on a tight car track i mean things happen quick and I think that's part of the excitement of riding a supermoto, but and that's that's definitely true of this one, especially. Uh the track itself, it was I think actually Ducati did a really good job picking that track because it had a little bit of everything. It had two at least two sections where you had really long, flowing, fast corners where the things banked over for a, a significant amount of time. Uh and then it also had a couple really tight uh switchback stuff. Uh, one chicane coming onto the front straight. Uh, so going back again, what, what Ducati said in their presentation and what they've told us is that there was like an extreme focus on weight bias and front end feel. So they really focused on getting weight over the front uh, compared to, they say the competition, I think it's 48.5% up over the front, 51.5 at the rear. Um, and then obviously you have, uh, a shorter wheelbase too, uh, which I think helps with the agility, but Going going into front end field, the biggest thing I noticed was in the longer sections when you had the thing banked over. And I'm I'm a heavier guy, I'm a bigger guy, six three, two hundred ish pounds, a little more with gear. So I I have the tendency to kind of sack the rear out a little bit, um, which did happen. But once we could added some preload to the rear, we were able to get a little bit more weight up over the front. And I I thought front end field was great. It, it, in no time when I was riding that bike in in the faster stuff, did I feel like I wasn't sure what the front end was doing. And then getting into the really tight stuff, hard on the brakes, diving down into a corner, the front end feel there was phenomenal. Like I was really impressed. That's I grew up racing at Willow Springs where you're not doing a bunch of hard braking or anything like that, any tight corner. So I'm not a very heavy breaker and I don't really ride the front very hard. Uh, but I was shocked at how late I could get in and just keep stabbing the brake and load that front and then still get the thing to steer into the corner just, just really easy. Uh, so that th- those were some of the things that stood out, at least on the front end. That's a good feeling. I mean, that's yeah. that's all you could ask for. Yeah, you were I, on slicks, right? You were you were on slicks. Should add should add that yeah, yeah. body had well, six you know, mounted hey. up. So so there is a a decent amount of grip, let's say for sure. Yeah. Um, the other thing I was I was going back and looking at GoPro footage as we were putting our video together, which hopefully folks will get to check out on YouTube soon uh that that really tight chicane it's a it's a right left right going onto the front straight there at the track and how quick that thing would steer through the chicane was was really impressive and i mean for sure i could feel that while i was riding but then it even stood out in video which sometimes it's hard for that stuff to stand out in video um well that's a it's a very important point because traditionally like ducati's you know if you watch the ducati and world superbike maybe more more years ago than more recently but like i was at uh monza uh years ago when uh troy bayless you know started out with ducati that it was a 2000 
he was brought up from Vance and Hines. So I was at Monza and I was covering basically Monza to write a feature, but I was watching them go through the chicanes and you could watch the Kawasaki Akira Yanagawa immediately go left to right, like instantaneous in all those chicanes. All the Ducati guys would go whoop and they would wait at the top of the roll and the bike would go hi yeah yeah and then they would put it over and you're not experiencing that you know that's that's it, it, at this point in time that is a vintage ducati yeah this is a modern ducati and you're seeing rapid roll rate no problems rapid roll rate and I, I think that was really important there especially on a cart track because everything's happening so quickly and the distance between the corners is so short that you almost don't have the time to to bustle the thing it's just it's boom you're, you're through the section so uh i think that was big the agility there i mean obviously it's got a almost an it's a full inch shorter uh wheelbase than you know than the husqvarna cast gas and ktm uh and i think that's and they had those bikes like just pointing out they put those motorcycles in the presentation like these are the bikes that we are targeting yeah, Correct. for sure. Yep. And that's that's something you don't see a lot. I, I don't think we see a lot in our industry is those direct comparisons. Um, but yeah, in the in the one tech document that they gave us, I think it was the first paragraph they they called out those models. I mean, there's no ifs, ands, or buts about it. I mean, that's the bike. That's the platform that they're going up against with this. Yeah, and they're really the, the you know, you can get a DRZ 400 SM, which is a really fun bike, but it's it's not you know it's it it doesn't start from the space of we're making a very large single that shreds you know we're making a legit motard which is what the you know yeah. the gas gas and the ktm and the husky are, are targeted as you know i mean yeah. they're really you know i mean ktm just says it ready to race right right yeah and you you go through a lot of the figures you know as as part of the event you know prepping for it going through all the the important numbers you know looking at you know those austrian bikes and looking at their tech specs and then looking at the ducati and they are very similar you know i think the the rake the on the ducati is it's a little bit steeper and again you have that that difference in the wheelbase but trail is essentially the same uh definitely suspension travel is the same so weight is weight's a little bit interesting because you know they say uh wet no fuel i think it is how yeah wet no fuel it. 333 yeah and then so there's a little bit of a discrepancy between how how uh husqvarna and ktm and gas gas how they do their their weight claims well this is just but, i'm gonna take a little pause welcome to cycle world where we we have certified scales and we measure the weight of the test bikes that we get so we're gonna get these bikes and we don't have to speculate yep, but for right now they're i mean for right now they are within pounds of each other i mean they are right. very very close the ducati claimed peak power 77 and a half is slightly higher than what the claimed power on the motard you know 700s that are yeah. uh, made by the austrian company so. that's that's actually an important point too because uh the engine actually surprised me a little bit in that uh i expected it to be this really peaky high revving engine and, and all the performance up there. And, and one of the first couple laps when I, I rolled through, like I said, that tight chicane going onto the front straight, it had a lot more bottom end and mid range than I expected it to having looked at the numbers and compared torque figures, especially to, to the KTM and those bikes. Uh, and I was surprised at how well it pulled off the corners. And it's funny actually, because in the presentation earlier in the day, you know, they, they talked us through the engine and, and they were talking about how, hey, remember this thing revs to 10,250 RPM. Don't don't short shift it. Make sure you're revving the thing all the way up. Um, <laughs> and then so I was expecting this very peaky engine, but it turned out like I was actually into the rev limiter before I even noticed it. Like it revved, it pulled right through the mid range, had that grunt. And then all of a sudden I was into the rev limiter and I was actually bumping up to the end of the rev limiter a couple of times. Uh, before I, I realized that I had to shift a little bit earlier. So that was an interesting dynamic from that engine that I didn't totally expect. Well, you're getting smoothness from the balancers and then it's making a lot of power. I mean, 77 and a half is no joke and you roll, you know, you roll on and, and away you go. Suddenly you're there. Yeah. No, I think I, one of the, one of the, what's really important here is the shape of the torque curve. Hmm. It has no shape. Look nice at, look, look at that. Uh, 250 Triumph, that that's just a flat line mostly. Oh, the the 250 Triumph motocross bike. Yes, yep. and they've done everything they can 
to increase their control over valve acceleration. It has double overhead cam, no unicam punches pulled. It has titanium valves and it has finger followers. Now, it may very well be that the step beyond that Desmo offers will take things further. But I think what's important here is this, this lovely, usable, uh, shapeless torque. It's just a line. And I think that gives the rider confidence that no matter what I'm doing here, or maybe if I screw up, there's acceleration available. I'm not going to have to tap it down. I can just go. Yeah, how and did I, you feel about like rolling on off the apex? That was no issues there. I, I will say, and I think I even I even wrote this in my story because I'm I'm not totally ashamed, but I actually stalled the bike a couple of times leaving a stop, which they um, they do admit that they have a, a taller first gear on the thing, so you're not running out of gear in first gear uh, quickly. So they they admit that and and not a ton of fly you know not a ton of flywheel inertia the mass the yep. rotating mass the kind of but we you know we we want quick revving and i'm here to vote for a tall first on a bike like that cuz yeah. i want a gear i want a gear that's usable and i'll cope with that on the street and and try my best yeah i think <laughs> you know? i think on the street and when we get the bike and do a little bit more street testing you know i think it's just one of those things let's be cognizant of and you know as i'm slip the clutch a little bit more and give it a little bit more gas is you know leaving stoplights yeah. and stuff but yeah i actually i did stall it twice so there mm. was that that was a little bit embarrassing in front of did you ever O'Hare. feel like you were in the wrong gear like what kevin was talking about like oh i i can't recover i gotta click back down and and get into a, a different you know lower gear to get my drive back I think I think what I could say there is that there was a couple of sections where I actually had options. I could I could hold the gear and because you have that taller rev limit, I could hold the gear and I would just start bumping into the rev limiter before I was rolling off. Um, but I had the engine was flexible enough and the power curve is wide enough that I I actually had the option. A couple of times, depending on how early I was on the gas, I could just run it in that same gear. Or, or I could do the upshift and then obviously have to go back down a downshift before the next corner. But there was some flexibility there. It wasn't that super narrow power band that, that, that really made it so that you had to make sure you were in the right gear every time. A uh, little bit of a side story, but just after that event, I went and rode uh, some KTMs, including the 390 Duke. And I was riding that, having just got off that the Ducati and that thing was so much work to, to keep in its happy, happy place. So like I was constantly shifting that thing. <laughs> a, and that was like, a 390. I'm sure it's tuned a little bit more on edge uh, to get everything they can out yeah. of it. But, yeah. but the, the, the window, the operating window on that thing yeah. was so narrow. We were just like really fast paced uh, street ride in this really tight canyons. And I was shifting all the time. And I was thinking back to the Ducati. And I was like, it really opened my eyes to how much, how flexible that engine was. Well, I'm that very was, curious on the Ducati, uh, you know the 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 way back machine here uh italian bikes were notorious for having uh peak power about three rpm before the rev limiter yes. <laughs> and there was like no over no over rev at all yeah. so i'm real curious to see what we have from here's the power building and we hit peak power and then how much over rev do we have before we we hit the rev limiter I'll be curious. We got to yeah. get it on the dyno to get the truth there, but yeah, yeah. Uh, based on, we have I mean, one. I generally pride myself on getting a good feel for that stuff. Unfortunately, like I said, I was bumping into the rev limit. It feels like it does start to taper off a little bit up up top, and 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 kind of gets a little bit muted, and then you're right into the to the limiter. So back in the um, old, and that was back in the two stroke days. Uh, over rev was at a premium because basically a two stroke engine is an organ pipe. It just plays one note. And Cut they, wood. They, they used to, they used to uh, retard the ignition past peak power uh, yep. and put a lot of heat into the pipe and make it act uh, longer, uh, make it act shorter, pardon me. Mm. And uh, that would give you a bunch of over rev. And I saw, I saw this done on a dyno. I said, here it is without the retard and here it is with the retard such a yeah. difference speaking of exhaust we should mention here that the ducati offers the termignoni exhaust for the hyper motard yeah. sounds brilliant i, I think yeah. mark you mentioned you saw a clip of us riding with the thing and you're like you just commented oh, yeah. on the sound 
but also, uh, what is it like? They claim seven horsepower. Plus seven, increase. yeah. Plus yeah, seven. And it's three point three pounds lighter. Nice. So yeah. that's that's pretty big. I think the the way to go if if you were looking at that bike was honestly I struggle a little bit with the price difference between the standard model and the RVE when realistically the RVE is is graphics and a quick shifter. You know that base model starts to look really good. You know, throw a quick shifter on separate if you want to. Uh, especially if you're doing, you know, going to a car track or something. Well, like in that. all fairness, it's, I mean, yes, you're right, but it's also going to be the fanciest quick shifter because it's going to be mapped as everybody's doing now. So that it works at like moderate throttle yeah. and it works at wide open throttle. And yeah. you're getting a lot, but yeah, it's, it's yeah. like $1,500 or something. And yeah. It's- no, it's fair. It, it was, it, it is a brilliant system. And again, mentioning one of the, the sections that I was talking about earlier, uh, where I was, I had the opportunity to kind of change gears or, I was, I was able to have the bike fully leaned over and shift and didn't upset the chassis or anything like that. So yeah, it's, it's definitely worth having. Um, I think the base model and then maybe throw that on, I don't know, or or you go the RVE because it does look a lot better with the graphics on it. I know it's just graphics and, and some colored wheels, but it does look, it does look a lot more exciting than the standard. Yeah. Well, one of the things that I want to point out about electronics, a lot of people, when they talk about electronics, they act like, oh, it's so expensive, oh, it's complicated, oh, you can't fix it. Um, When a certain system first appears, it's a special. But two years later, it's on the same chip with, with everything else. And it's added two cents to the cost of the chip. So uh, I think that that we don't have to be too frightened of electronics because it's it has the potential to be made available to everyone. How many people have a cell phone? I mean, a very substantial percentage of the world's population now has a smartphone. And that is the same phenomenon that I'm talking about. Yeah, it's and there's there's no shortage of electronics on on this bike. Right. I think that's a big thing. A big push for Ducati is, is, you know, bringing a lot of that technology that they've developed elsewhere in their lineup and and bringing it onto this bike, which is just like the cylinder head. They already had the cylinder head. Let's use it again and again. Good point. Yep. Yeah. Uh, An interesting one uh, is that slide by brake function as well, which we got to talk to the engineers a little bit about. Uh, which luckily, because it was more towards the end of the day, and I finally asked, like, "Hey, how does how does that actually work?" Uh, and so there's there's four levels. Um, uh, in in level two, you still have ABS on the rear, but what they're doing is they're letting the bike step out a certain degree. Mm-hmm. And and what they told us is basically all that's doing it's working off the ABS system. And it's just relieving some some pressure. Obviously, you're gathering data from the IMU, understanding the bike attitude, and then and then adjusting brake pressure from there. Yeah. So uh, that's, well, that is a unique system to see. You've got all this computing power that you've paid for in the ECU. Um, it should be working on your income tax while you're riding. So let, it, <laughs> yeah. let it do what it can do. You know? Yeah. I mean, it's a, that stuff's amazing. The, I mean, slide by brake. And I've used uh, the Enduro, the lean sensitive Enduro brakes on KTMs and all that. And, you know, we've said this on the show before, you know, electronics are exceptionally good now and you used to feel them working. And a lot of, most of the time you don't actually feel them working. You just feel like, dang, I'm good. Yeah. <laughs> you know, <laughs> the, the, hardest wrong thing with there, that. <laughs> the hardest thing there is, is, is telling your, your mind to, to trust them completely. Right. Especially yeah. like with the slide by break where, because every input that you put into the bike is going into the computer and it's, it's changing what, you know, right. what the system want to do. So for instance, you grab the clutch lever or you twist the throttle a little bit more, or you roll off the throttle or you let off the brake. It's, those are all inputs going into the bike and now it's trying to recalculate what's going on. So especially uh, again, trying to ride this like a super motorbike and slide the rear into the corner with this slide by brake where it's like, you've got to just, you got to get a little weight over the front, the front brake, and then slam on the rear brake and uh and then just trust the system that it's you know it's not going to slide past where it's it's yeah. programmed to and and not put any other inputs into it right by releasing the brake or chopping the throttle or whatever this is whatever my personal is. this is my personal struggle with wheelie control is like Absolutely. just 
can't do it. And then I'm trying to control it in my right wrist and the computer's like, dude, what? <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Did you want something? Yeah, yeah, it's just, yeah. But it, yeah, you, it, we are at the point where it's, it's okay. It's okay to put faith in electronics on bikes. Rider aids are amazing. So if you could like nutshell this, the riding experience for us and we'll, we'll close it down here. We'll, we'll exit. But a couple sentences, like basically what are we looking at in, in the, in the, uh, the mono RV and standard? What are you? Uh, exciting, busy, fun. Uh, all those, all those things three things come together in one. I, and I think that's, that's how you describe most, most super moto bikes. So I, and, and I, I know that's very generic, but I think the thing is, is that this is Ducati's, let's say first attempt at building a really aggressive street legal super moto. Okay. Yeah. The hyper moto has been a hyper motard has been around, but this is going a bit different direction with the platform. So it's really their first try with that and with this new engine. And I think they're, they're right on par with the competition, right? They're they're They've built a bike that, really honors the category and it is is what you expect if you were to walk into a dealership and 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 buy a, a supermoto bike right so, so you've ridden you've ridden v4s v twins all the super bikes super scramblers that whole thing uh you know like does it feel like a ducati yeah oh absolutely yeah i mean it to me it's it's higher quality and and obviously more performance and more fun than than any of the scramblers um to me, it's got a little bit more edge than a monster. I always think a monster is kind of in this weird place where it, it wants the Ducati performance, but it's, it's, it's a little bit less on edge than what you'd expect from a Ducati. And, and this, well, there's street. Yeah. I mean, that that's an entire show is monster, the evolution <laughs> yes, of monster, yeah. because monster was a stripped super bike with the air cooled motor in it. And it, and now we have scramblers, which are sort of taking that mantle. And then monsters are like, oh, we're performance. We have liquid cooling. And they're, I mean, the recent monsters are the SPs and stuff that we've had have been phenomenally fun to ride. But there is sort of the, what's the spiritual target of the monster when you have Street Fighters? Well, if you have a Street Fighter V4, it's like, if I want mental naked bike, I'm going Street Fighter right. V4, right. right? So there's a little bit of a, you know, I mean good problems to have um great show thanks for coming in bradley i love your hat by the way superb i don't know where you got it but <laughs> sign me up <laughs> Not to the boss. um yeah great great uh great to hear about the bike um thanks again kevin um uh if you like what we're doing like down there hit that bell thing and we'll ring your bell thing in your youtube uh, I hope you're listening on Spotify or, or Apple podcasts while you're driving or something. Not too, don't pen, pay too much attention to us, uh, and comment, comment down there and let us know what you want to hear about. And, uh, we'll address that on a future show. We hope. Thanks everybody.